Vic's Matinee Theater. Vic's Matinee Theater, presented by the makers of Vic's Vapor Rub, brings you Beloved Enemy, starring Victor Jory as Dennis Reardon. Now, here's a good thing to remember when you catch a cold. The best-known home remedy for relieving miseries of colds is Vicks VapoRub. Ladies and gentlemen, today from the stage of the Matinee Theater, Vicks brings you one of the most memorable love stories ever told. Beloved Enemy, adapted from Samuel Goldwyn's great motion picture. Our story opens in the city of Dublin in 1921. 1921 in Ireland. A time of unrest and discontent. A time when right or wrong, rebellion flamed through the land and good men on both sides died for their convictions. And foremost among these, a hero to his followers, but to the authorities of England only a name, Dennis Reardon. Did you hear the news? Yes. McCarthy, O'Brien, and Casey dead. They were brave lads. They saved our records. They were brave lads. I grew up with Tom O'Brien. I've lost a brother. Well, the men are all assembled in the cellar for the meeting. Will you come down now? I. Did you hear that Lord Atley and his daughter are arriving from England tonight? That I did. The English government has sent Lord Atley to come over and see what can be done about us. He's going to find we're quite a problem. Eh, Burke? Uh. I understand, too, that there's a shipment of munitions arriving tonight. A shipment of munitions, eh? That's right. Blown up our munition ship. This is intolerable negligence on your part, Captain Loder. But, Lord Athley, you don't understand the situation. I don't have enough men to cover all of Dublin. We're not at war with Ireland, you know. I never know where they're going to strike next. It's your business to know. But uh, Reardon's spies are in the post office, the telephone exchanges, army, police. They're everywhere. Anything we decide here, Reardon knows in two hours. And I, I don't even know what the man looks like. Well, you'd better find out what he looks like. Because if we don't get him pretty soon, there's going to be war between Ireland and England. We're doing everything we can, Lord Atley. Oh, there you are, Captain Loder. There's some soldiers out here with a very handsome prisoner. If uh, you don't want him, I'll take him. I'll be right out, Lady Helen. No, bring him in here. Let's see your efficiency in action, Loder. Very well. Uh, I'll bring him in here. I'll just sit down and watch if you don't mind, Father. Do it yourself, my dear, but don't interrupt. Wait outside, men. This man was picked up close to the dock where the munition ship was destroyed, Your Lordship. Ah, I see. What's your name? Dennis Reardon. You're taking a dangerous name, my man. The best is none too good for me, my man. Oh, impudent young rascal. They find any papers on him, Loder? Yes, sir. Here they are. Ah, Thomas Casey. Mm-hmm. Medical student, eh? Well, Mr. Casey... What were you doing in the vicinity of the explosion? I was riding a bike home from the university, as peaceful as you'd please. When all of a sudden I heard a terrific noise, and I fell off my bike. And then some soldiers came along, and would you believe it now? I was whisked into a lorry bicycle and all, and brought up here and asked what I was doing back there. Is it now forbidden to ride through our own streets? <laughs> Helen! Uh, I beg your pardon? Let the man go, Lada. Ed, give his bicycle. All right, you may go. Thank you kindly. And thank you, too, for bringing me here. Don't be impudent. Begging your pardon, I meant it sincerely. For I've had one look at a woman I'll never forget. Why, thank you. You know, I've always wondered whether the romantic stories I heard about the Irish were true. And now... And now... Why, now I see they are. <coughs> <coughs> Helen. Good night to you, my lady. The good saints bless you and keep you. Good night, Dennis Reardon. The same to you. They're all alike, Lady Helen, full of blarney. Yes, and isn't it attractive? Hobbs!
stop and rest for a moment. All right. Oh, it's beautiful out here, isn't it? So beautiful it almost hurts. Yes, it is. I'm a country man at heart myself, you know. Someday I'm going to have a bit of a farm in County Galway with some fine pigs and horses on it. All by yourself? Indeed not. There'll be a fine-spirited woman in my house making a great clamor all day and children driving me crazy with her goings on. <laughs> and there'll be some fine rich earth for plowing and a brook and a leprechaun at the doorstep. And you'll always have to remember to leave him a bit of cream at night or he'll be very angry. Oh, I'd never forget a leprechaun. I don't think you would. Would you like to meet me at Dublin Market tomorrow? I'm buying the first pig. Would you like to help me pick him out? No, I can't do that. Eh, so far as the world goes, we've nothing in common, have we? No, I'm afraid we haven't. And there's no reason we should be friends, is there? There's every reason we shouldn't. Then let's not be friends. Let's just come here again and forget who we are and talk about farms and County Galway. No, Dennis, we must not. Come on. We'd better start back. Just in case you change your mind, I'll be waiting at four o'clock at the pig stalls. Tim, my boy, is this not a fine-looking pig? Hey, the Dennis, our English friend Captain Loder is close by, looking at cabbages and taking quite an interest in you and your pigs. Yeah, I see, I see. I think I'll be asking you to put this pig by for me, Mr. O'Hoolahan. All right, so that I will. There's some more of the English over there by the chickens. Oh, quick, before they surround us. Have you any coins? Aye. Uh, then throw them in the air quickly and get away while the kids are scrambling for them. Come on! Here you are, ladies! Scramble! I'm glad you came. When I wrote you the note and gave you my new address, I didn't know whether you'd come to my house or not, seeing as how you weren't at the market yesterday. This is the last time I will ever meet you. You see, I'm not your friend. I'm your enemy. I know you're Dennis Redden. Pater told me without realizing it. That's how they knew you'd be at the market yesterday. Through me. Did you also tell them you were meeting me here today? No. It's... No use asking you not to hate me. I'd better go. No, no, don't. Don't go. Sit down and talk a bit. It may be a long time before we're meeting again. We can never see each other again. You know that now, don't you? Yes, I know it now. But all the years after you've gone from me, I'll be thinking of what might have been. And maybe it would be good to know if, if we thought of it in the same way. Maybe it would. Every evening, I'd have asked you to meet me on top of the hilltop. What would you have said to that when I asked you? I'd have said, thank you, Dennis Reardon. I'll be there. And all through the summer evenings, we'd have walked on the hills side by side. Not talking much, wouldn't we have? We wouldn't have needed to talk much except to say, look at those stars. And did you ever see such a moon? And one evening, I'd have put my arm around you. And us walking alone in the moonlight. And what would you have said then? I don't think I'd have said anything. I think I would just have sighed. A happy sigh. Oh, very. Then we'd have walked slower and slower and stopped. And I'd have said, Ah, it's the honest and beautiful woman you are. Oh, Dennis, don't. Don't say any more. And I'd have said, I love you. And after we were married, we'd be on my farm in County Galway, riding fine horses together and us laughing crazy all day long. Oh, Dennis, hold me close. Don't ever let me go. Dennis, my dearest. My darling. My darling. Look, darling, it's dark out. I think I must take you home now. Oh, Dennis. I love you so. No, no, don't cry, my darling. It's hard not to cry. I've never been in love before. And to have had love for such a little time. And then to let it go. It's 
seems past all bearing. Someday. When I finish what I must do, I'll come looking for you. And if you have not changed your mind, perhaps you'll go with me to County Galway. I won't change my mind. I'll wait, Dennis. No matter how long it is. And I'll come to you no matter when it is. And I'll begrudge every minute of every hour on every clock in the world until my job is done and we can be together. Goodbye, my dearest. Goodbye, my darling. In just a moment, we'll bring you Act Two of Beloved Enemy from the stage of Vic's Matinee Theater. When your child suffers the miseries of a cold, everybody seems to have advice on what to do about it. But if you took a public opinion poll, you'd find that the modern way most mothers use to relieve distress of their children's colds is to rub on Vic's VapoRub. Now, for such an outstanding preference, there must be a basic proven reason. The moment you rub on VapoRub, it starts to work to bring fine relief right in the very places where distress is. VapoRub penetrates, penetrates into the cold, congested upper bronchial tubes with its special soothing medicinal vapors. And at the same time, it stimulates, stimulates chest and back surfaces like a comforting, warming poultice. For hours, this penetrating, stimulating action of VapoRub keeps on working to bring gratifying relief. It invites restful sleep, and often by morning, most of the misery of the cold is gone. Try it yourself. Just rub on Vapor Rub tonight and re- remember, only Vapor Rub gives you this special penetrating, stimulating action. It's the best known home remedy for relieving miseries of colds. Vicks Vapor Rub. Now, the second act of Beloved Enemies starring Victor Jory. As our curtain rises, we're in England. And in the London house of Lord Athley, we find Lady Helen talking to her father. Father, have you made up your mind what you're going to say to Parliament? Yes. I'm going to recommend that Reardon and the delegates selected from his party be invited to England to see if we can't negotiate. Oh, Father, that's wonderful. If he does come, Helen, I shall hold you to your promise. You're not to see him alone. I say, if he comes. Very well, Father. But he'll come. You'll see. He'll come. <laughs> Father, Lord Athley. Father, Mr. Reardon. Lord Athley, how do you do, sir? I believe the last time we met, your name was... Was Reardon, sir. Yes, yes. I trust you will enjoy this reception we've planned in your honor. My daughter will see that you meet everyone. It was very kind of you, sir. met Lord and Lady Huntington, Sir Cecil Brownley. I do hope I've presented you to everyone. Hello, Helen. Hello, Dennis. Oh, my dear, you're so beautiful. If only I could take him on. Oh, darling, if only you could. But we cannot see each other alone. I gave my oath. I had to do something like that, too. I hate reception. I know. So do I. Oh, don't look at me like that. Everyone will know. Um... Don't you admire that portrait, Mr. Reardon? It's a Reynolds, you know. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. Perhaps I should go. Oh, no, please. It's torture seeing you like this. It's better than not seeing you at all. Come, let me show you about the house. There's 
the library in there. Hmm. What things in your life happened in that room? That's where I played the harp when I was 14, in a pink dress. Ah, uh, in the room? My mother's sitting room. I used to say my prayers in there before she died. Then for ten years, I never went into it once. I do now. And do you pray there now? Yes, for you. And for peace, Dennis. Maybe this conference will mean peace. It could, couldn't it, Dennis? It could, Helen. But it isn't very likely. Helen, some of our guests are ready to leave. Oh, uh, I'll come at once, Father. I wish you luck at the conferences tomorrow, Dennis. You and Ireland. The delegates from Ireland must realize that we've made concessions far beyond our original intentions. In the past few days, we have conceded point after point in our efforts to reach a satisfactory conclusion. <clears throat> You're reaching for the moon, gentlemen. And we cannot give it to you. It's all or nothing, Dennis. Don't let them bluff you into compromising. They've given in on so many of our big points, Burke. They have not given in on all. Uh, gentlemen. Gentlemen! It is not enough. Then further discussion is useless. War is inevitable. We are tired and our vision is blurred. The fate of millions of people lies in our hands. I urge the leniency of our friends, the Irish. And beg the continuance of this conference tomorrow. Here, here. Is that satisfactory, Mr. Reardon? I hold but little hope that anything further can be accomplished. The issue between us is clear cut. But before we all take an irrevocable step, we will consent to one more meeting. Very well. We are adjourned until tomorrow. <laughs> Burke, we knew when we came here the best we could get would be a compromise. Let them compromise. Oh, but compromising can't be on one side. They've already offered us more than Ireland has ever honestly hoped to get. That's right, it is. I think we should take what they offer, and maybe a little later we can win a few more points. We were sworn to demand everything or nothing. Oh, what's the good of arguing? You hold the deciding vote, Dennis. That's right. In your vote hangs the balance of war or peace for Ireland, Dennis. Have you made up your mind? I'm going out for a walk, I've got to think. They made us some fine promises today. There's no denying it. They won't put them on paper. They just said they'll have home rule, and we must take their word for it. Well, I'm not willing to take anyone's word for anything. And if you do, Dennis Reardon, you will answer to the people for it. They want their rights, and they've sent you here to get them for them. Now, what are you going to do about it? I'm going for a walk. I have to think. Mind your promise about that woman, Dennis. I've not broken it, Bert. <laughs> Dennis, I'm so glad I found you. I asked for you at the hotel, and the clerk said he thought you were here in the park. I've sworn not to see you alone. Do you think Ireland would be completely destroyed if you kissed me? Just once. Oh, Helen. Oh, darling, but you're enough to make a man forget life and country and promises. Dennis... And... It's your vote that's going to mean war or peace, isn't it? Yes. And I'm racking my brain and my heart for the answer. I can't forget the lads who died and all they fought for. Is it wrong to remember those who want to live? It is. If we fail the dead in order to bring easy comfort to the living, my country and its cause must come first before any man's right to live. Until we have freedom, we have nothing. They're giving you that? No, they're only promising us that. And not on paper. Then take the promise and fight if it isn't kept. Give us a chance to keep it. Don't ever let your country go to war, Dennis Ridden, over something that can be settled peacefully. We are not without honor. We have made you a promise. Give us a chance to keep that promise. Dennis, the right of thousands of people to live and be happy are in your hands. You have no right not to try the compromise if you're very good at heart. Good night, Helen. I... I must leave you now. Dennis, what are you going to do? I have to walk and think some more.
On behalf of the Irish Republic, I accept the promises of the English Committee. We agree to your compromise. It's done, Helen. They've signed it. Where's Dennis? He left on the afternoon boat for Ireland. Helen, that man is one of the bravest I've ever known. Heaven help him. When he signed that treaty, he was as good as signing his own death warrant. And he knew it. Death warrant? Yes. The fanatics of his own party won't stand for compromise. They'll all look upon him as a traitor. I'm going to him, Father. Helen, to go to him would be very dangerous. I must go to him, Father. All right. I understand. We'll go together, daughter. For 800 years, Irish patriots have fought for this freedom. There he is, Father. He's speaking, see, on that platform. Let's get closer where we can hear him. ...government of its own. And now, for the first time in Irish history, we have that government. <laughs> among us some men who still believe that Ireland is not ready for peace. I hope I may live long enough to prove to them that what has been gained today is everything we should hope for at this time, and that what will be gained in the future depends no longer on gunpowder and hatred, but on the peaceful understanding of the people. Our future, under the treaty, is a brighter one than any Irishman has ever known. But it must be built wisely and sanely. And above all, it must be built on peace. There's the man that sold us out for a woman. There's the traitor. Kill him. Father, Father, they killed him. Come, we must get to him. Well, Doctor? He'll be all right. It's just a flesh wound. Go along in there now. He's waiting for you. Well, now, woman, what are you doing here in Ireland without an invitation? Without an invitation, is it? And who was it that invited me to live on a farm in County Galway? Careful now. The doctor says I'm not to be excited. Don't you be shouting at me. If I have any trouble with you, Dennis Ridden, I'll take it to the people. I saw how it was with you and the people tonight, after Burke shot you. He's in jail right now, thinking over his mistakes. The people are going to try it your way, Dennis. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. Oh, well, then, I... I guess my job is finished. And I can take it easy for the rest of my life on that bit of a farm with you. Take it easy? Land alive, listen to the man. With a plowing and a planting and farming and milking and butchering and carpentering to be done, he's talking about resting. May the saints bless us and keep us. The English are no better than the Irish. You're talking the same way my mother used to talk to my father. <laughs> and when you finish that milk and Patrick Reardon, you can set your mind and your hand to fixing the back step. <laughs> it all goes to the farm in County Galway, darling. How does it sound to you? How does it sound? Ah, uh, come here where I can put my arm around you, Helen, my darling, and I'll spend the rest of the evening telling you. Would you mind kissing me first? Would I mind kissing you? Oh, oh, oh what a question to be asking an Irishman. In just a moment, Mr. Jory will tell you about next week's production. Meanwhile, a very timely message. If you have a cold today, are you going to wake up tomorrow morning feeling just too miserable to get through the day's work? Or are you going to rub on Vicks VapoRub tonight? You see, the moment you rub VapoRub on your throat, chest, and back, it starts right to work bringing grand relief. It helps relieve congestion and irritation in the upper breathing passages, 
the coughing spasms, sore throat, and that muscular soreness or tightness. And here's why the results are so comforting and gratifying. VapoRub penetrates. Penetrates into the cold, congested upper bronchial tubes with its special soothing medicinal vapors. And at the same time, it stimulates. Stimulates chest and back surfaces like a comforting, warming poultice. What's more, this penetrating, stimulating action of VapoRub keeps on working for hours while you sleep to bring you wonderful comfort. Now make sure you get VapoRub because only VapoRub gives you this special penetrating, stimulating action. The best known home remedy for relieving miseries of colds. Vicks VapoRub. This is Victor Jory. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your many kind letters and your suggestions. I'm answering your letters as rapidly as possible. Your suggestions for future plays are most welcome. And if you care to write, you may address me in care of Columbia Broadcasting, 22, New York. Next week from the stage of Matinee Theater, we will present that delightful RKO picture, My Favorite Wife. Leo McCary's hilarious story of a man who found on the night of his second wedding that the first wife he had thought dead was very much alive. Next week, my favorite wife. Our play was directed by Richard Sandville and was adapted by Gene Holloway from Samuel Goldwyn's motion picture. Mr. Goldwyn will soon present his latest Technicolor comedy, The Princess and the Pirate, starring Bob Hope at your local theater. Music for our series is under the direction of Mark Warno. The part of Helen was played by Gertrude Warner. Be sure and listen again next week when Vic's Matinee Theater presents My Favorite Wife, starring Victor Jory. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>